and an apex predator that we fear and admire. In our imaginations, they roam the jungle. But today, many tigers have never even seen the wild. The vast majority of them spend their lives in captivity. Princess is an American tiger, a distant relative of her wild ancestors. She doesn't even know how to hunt. Most tigers in America aren't found in zoos. They're privately owned. There are more than twice as many of them as the highly endangered wild tiger. This could change if new legislation is passed that would ban the private ownership and breeding of tigers. What are the issues surrounding captive tigers in America? And what does the future hold for their wild cousins? Tigers are one of the world's most popular animals. Everybody loves to see a tiger at the zoo. Even the scientists who work around them are impressed by their majesty. Ron Tilson is the senior conservation advisor at the Minnesota Zoo and a renowned expert on tigers. He spent many years tracking and studying them in the jungles of Asia. My heart beats faster every time I see one. Yeah, there is, um, it's because everything, they represent everything. They are the icon of Asian wilderness. They are the most powerful cat, the largest cat. They are, in my opinion, one of the most attractive cats. Um, but it's also the fact that essentially we have evolved as a species uh, with the tiger. And the tiger is one of the only animals on Earth that preys and eats people. And when a tiger looks at a human being, I think the tiger sees us for exactly what we are. We are nothing more than a piece of meat. The tiger and the power it represents has always fascinated us. At the beginning of the 20th century, there were 100,000 tigers in the forests of Asia. The first tigers came to America as entertainers. Before zoos and circuses attempted to control their breeding, surplus animals found their way into private hands. Soon, everyone from the rich and famous to companies and sports teams wanted a piece of the big cat. For some Americans, like the character of Tony Montana in the movie Scarface, owning a tiger became a symbol of success. Martin Dins is a celebrity veterinarian and was one of the first to specialize in exotic animals. His talent and reputation led him to work for A-list stars like Michael Jackson and the magicians Siegfried and Roy. He witnessed firsthand the rise of the tiger population in America. The tiger pet phenomenon became a trend, I would say, in the early 60s. We could be driving in Beverly Hills and see a person driving a convertible with a tiger sitting up in the back seat. Or people owning a Jaguar, a big Jaguar, driving around in their Jaguar with it. There were no import restrictions. There were no restrictions on the sale out of a pet shop of these kind of animals. You know, a little tiger cub is nice and cute. So people thought it would be fashionable. It was unique. They could show it off. And it was trendy then. The pet tiger phenomenon may have existed briefly in other parts of the world, but it never had the dimensions it's taken on in America. In the 1970s, actress Tippi Hedren, the star of Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds, embarked on an unusual film project. She starred in the movie Roar, where actors and crew members rubbed shoulders with dozens of lions and tigers. I can't believe we did all that, that we were foolish enough to do it, so many of us were hurt. You know, that it was, uh, you know, uh, insanity. 
It was truly insane here. Tippi Hedren radically changed. She converted the Roar movie set into the Shambhala Preserve, a sanctuary for abused and neglected big cats. Her strong stance against private ownership has drawn attention to the issues facing captive and wild big cats. In the wild, tigers are threatened by habitat destruction and human encroachment. They've been hunted and poached for their skins. Most of all, they suffered from the illegal trade of their parts for use in traditional medicine. 97% of the species have been wiped out over the last 100 years. And with only 3,200 wild tigers left, they are facing a total crisis. Well, just about everything has been tried, and just about everything has failed. Everyone is trying to think through how to go about making a future for tigers, and the bottom line is, is that we've failed uh, in every, um, every example. There is no one place you can put your finger and say, aha, here's the magic formula on how to save tigers. Tigers have been on the endangered species list since it was established. In 1973, it became illegal to import tigers born in the wild. So the tigers living in the United States today are American, born and raised. The population of captive tigers has been steadily growing. In the wild, a female spends a couple of years teaching her three or four cubs how to hunt and fend for themselves. But in captivity, she can breed every year. Today, most American tigers are privately owned, and some people still keep them as pets. Susanna Kukol and Scott Shoemaker live in the small town of Pahrump, Nevada, with their six tigers. Hi, baby. I know, I know. Mama's girl, huh? If your definition of pet is something you throw food at and it's nice and docile, okay, then. That's not a tiger. That's my girl. That's my girl. Oh, that's my girl. In the cage, it's, it's just fun. Outside, that's when it's like, OK, we are going for the walk. We are going to go for the training. So outside, it's like you are in school. In the cage, it's OK, it's, it's their place. It's their home. Oh, somebody's being killed. So basically, that's the golden rule. You don't push them into any serious training in the cage, and you, you never ever turn the back on a tiger. But not all captive tigers are pets or collector's items. Some private owners see themselves as conservationists and believe America is the tiger's Noah's Ark. Patty Perry runs her own Center for Conservation and Education in Southern California. She is also the vice president of the Feline Conservation Federation the largest organization promoting private ownership and breeding of captive exotic cats in the United States. It's far from perfect, but in our world today, we have to have captive breeders, private captive breeders. We have to have private educators because the zoos can't do it all. You don't get that kind of contact and that kind of one-on-one -on -one at a zoo. They have been poached, they have been hunted, for their pelts and for their internal organs, and we have very, very low populations. This is Prana, the standard. The Snow White is Vishnu. This is my little red-headed stepchild, and this is the one, the golden tabby. He's gonna be our biggest tiger here. The tigers is very much an emotional bond. Um, they, they respond emotionally. I, I got them all as babies, so I bottle raised them. So there is that connection. You know, they identify me as, you know, I, mom with the milk. Who wants to feed a tiger? <laughs> I kind of start on this end and give you guys a chance. I want you to hold the stick. Just hold the stick and put it right through there. Come and have a bite. Okay. Next? These cats being six generations. All right you know, captive bred and their, you know, their, their primary contact being human beings are not going to be the same as a cat that's in the wild. It's a completely different animal. 
But I, will they ever be domesticated? No. They're wild animals. The wild nature of tigers is seen even among those in captivity. In 2003, famous Las Vegas entertainer Roy Horn was mauled during a performance by one of his beloved tigers. The tiger just grabs him, like, looks be right around here in this area, grabs him, like, just locks on him, picks him up, and just drags him. We just heard all this commotion behind the curtain, and you could hear. It reminded everyone that even trained tigers are unpredictable and dangerous. For 40 years, those guys did two to three shows a day. In the beginning, seven days a week. That's a lot of exposure to a tiger. If you fall down in front of one of these big cats, and especially with tigers, they're going to carry you off, regardless of what your relationship is with them. He's got a thing for me, Patty. I know. He does. In my career as a zoological veterinarian, I've worked the gamut of facilities and owners that have tigers. There's the zoos. There's the circuses. There's the private collectors. And years ago, there were a lot more of the illicit uh, owners of these animals. But I've worked for all of them, and I don't, I don't discriminate. I have done the best I can to discourage breeding by unqualified individuals. But I, I took an oath, and is it my business to Say, no, I'm not going to treat this tiger because you own it privately. That's, that's on the other side of medicine for me. Lisa Ann Tukansnik is an attorney in Washington, D.C. Her organization, the Wildcat Conservation Legal Aid Society, is trying to determine the exact number of privately owned tigers. Hey, I'm calling to follow up with you on the tiger research you were going to finalize some of the numbers for which state are you still working on? What are we looking at? Alabama. The actual number of tigers in the United States is still a matter of speculation. But the enforcement of laws already in place is problematic. Legislation varies from state to state. At the federal level, the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Interior both enforce different laws affecting tigers. There is no single government body responsible for tiger welfare. Well, we don't really know how many tigers are held captive in the United States. It's a very good question because estimates tend to go all over. Some say there's 5,000 cats in captivity, tigers. Some say there's up to 10. The problem with the numbering system is that the two federal agencies that are there to enforce our Endangered Species Act and the Animal Welfare Act don't know how many tigers are out there, which is very troubling because we need to get a handle on the number of cats. As hard as it is to imagine, big cats can be found everywhere, even on the fifth floor of an apartment building in the heart of New York City, like on an October day in 2003. This police video shows Ming, a full-grown 325-pound tiger, left home alone by its owner in Unit 5E of a Harlem apartment building. If the number and the location of big cats is a source for concern, a larger concern might just be the irresponsible owners. Screening for them remains difficult. In 2005, near the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library in Moore Park, a stunning example of human-tiger conflict occurred. I saw a tiger um, right there. Just real slow, huge, he was about this high up to the fence. Newly retired George Gross was the incident commander at the California Fish and Game Department. For more than three weeks, he chased a tiger on the loose in a residential area. He got no help from the cat's owner, and on a February morning, he had a difficult decision to make. Basically, this was like a city living in fear for a month because somewhere there was this large tiger running around in their neighborhood. We didn't see it for quite a while, but we knew it was in here. 
So when it climbed out, it was like it came out of nowhere. All of a sudden, everybody could see it, and it started walking around quite slowly through the grass. You know, I was within 150 yards of it. Uh, first thing I thought was like, what a majestic animal. This thing's beautiful. But then, uh, you know, I came back in. It's like, uh, but I have this job to do, too. So it started walking towards me, and then it started going up a trail. I sat there and said, I can't have it up here on the soccer field, baseball field, and our opportunity to take a shot really diminishes. So that's when I gave the order for uh, people with rifles to, if they had a clean shot, to take the shot. The male tiger weighing as much as 600 pounds was taken from the hills near the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library by wildlife officials who say they had no choice but to kill it. I've always felt that I unfortunately made the right decision. And, you know, to be honest, is the first thing I did was pat him and say I was sorry. Because I knew I didn't want to kill him. George Gross was not the last law enforcement agent faced with such a decision. There was an even more dramatic incident on October 18th, 2011 when there was a massive release of wild animals in Zanesville, Ohio. The owner of a private zoo threw open the gates of his facility before committing suicide. This time, it wasn't one tiger, but 18 on the loose. They were all killed by the authorities along with lions, bears, and monkeys. It probably will come to another tragedy before certain laws are either enforced like they should be or new laws are going to have to be implemented to have multiple situations happen because we're not moving on these issues is very tragic and it's very sad not only for the individuals but the cats that are involved because most of the time those cats are shot on site i'd rather see us be in a proactive mode versus a reactive mode is it time to ban the private ownership of tigers and other exotic animals? Twenty-six states banned the private ownership of tigers, but in many states, it's still legal to own and breed them, if you have a permit. Stories of tiger cubs sold at swap meets or on the internet are galvanizing the movement to ban private ownership of big cats. And in Washington, a political and legal battle is underway. People can't believe that these animals are still being born to be sold as pets. And you can get them for any amount of money if you're foolish enough to pay. And when you see those little cubs, it, they're cute. But by the time they're seven months old, they are tearing up your house and taking a pretty good chunk out of you because they don't have a 400-pound mom to say, knock it off, nor do they have any siblings with whom to play. So you become the sibling, and they're tough. As you're dealing with an apex predator, they are top of the food chain, one of four of the most dangerous animals in the world. And yet our government says that's OK, and uh, they will even give a permit to have these apex killers in somebody's backyard. It's very wrong. Tippi Hedren decided that something needed to be done and contacted her congressman. She successfully proposed a new law to prevent taking big cats across state lines. But this was just the beginning. So I took a, a bill to Washington in 2003. Uh, it was simply to stop these animals moving from one state to another. And um, uh, it took two years. It was called the title the Captive Wildlife Safety Act. It was sort of a precursor to the bill that I, I am ultimately, my goal is to have a bill that will stop the breeding of all of these animals to be sold as a pet or for financial gain. Tippi Hedren isn't alone in her quest to end the private ownership and breeding of tigers. Conservation organizations fear that the captive population of American tigers could contribute to the lucrative global trade in tiger parts for traditional medicines. For now, tiger farms in China and poaching are the main source of parts. To have a state law, and we have 50 states, 
banning breeding of tigers in captivity would be too problematic. And it's easier to make it a federal regulation. Then we don't have 50 different laws that could have as many different exemptions, so it's easier to do it at the federal level. The private ban is really focused on going after the individuals or these backyard breeders that are sort of out of the radar. Many private owners who have all their permits believe they have every right to keep tigers. Come on, TJ. Well, the possibility of a federal ban would be a nightmare. There are more and more and more restrictions all the time, all the time. More and more regulations and more and more restrictions. You, you have to, again, you have to be organized. You have to have lobbyists. Um, you have to present your side of it to the right people. It's a political thing. It's a money thing. The organizations pushing for the ban are also concerned about tiger welfare. Even federal agencies have set very low standards of care. A three by three meter cage is the minimum requirement. Tammy Tees manages the Wildcat Sanctuary in Minnesota. She has heard countless stories of abused animals and careless owners. Most of the animals, including the tigers at the sanctuary, come from people who think a tiger would make a good pet. We hear all the stories. It got aggressive. It turned on me. I can't find vet care. I lost my homeowner's insurance. Um, you know, I didn't know it would get this big. I didn't know it would eat this much. And we tell people, a wild animal is not a pet, and it never should be kept as one. Titan behind me, that tiger was illegally owned and should have been seized under the state law. Had he been seized prior to that, um, his owner would still be alive today. Stopping people from acquiring and breeding tigers motivates animal rights defenders and conservationists, but private breeders defend their practice by saying that if tigers were to go extinct in the wild, it would be better to have captive tigers than none at all. This view is highly controversial. My question is, if you ban these animals, we can no longer keep and breed them, so it will be, they will be extinct in captivity. Now they go extinct in the wild. What have you accomplished? You killed the species. A ban on breeding or keeping tigers has broad implications. While the United States looks to control unregulated breeding of tigers by private owners, across the world, extraordinary efforts are being made to save tigers in the wild. For Ron Tilson, zoo tigers represent a backup for the wild population. He has been the coordinator of the Tiger Species Survival Plan, designed to maintain healthy and genetically diverse tigers. In the zoo world, we try and have what we call a hands-off management. That means let's not touch tigers, let's not play with tigers, let's consider them really quite dangerous. For the longest time, I refused to even call a tiger by a name. I'm not particularly fond of house names. <clears throat> to me, they're numbers. Um, they're a stud book number, and I see a tiger more as a collection of genes. <clears throat> and what I'm concerned about is the future, way down the line, that these animals still maintain their tigerness. Scientists have divided tigers into nine subspecies. Three of them have already gone extinct. The Bali tiger in the 1940s the Caspian tiger in the 1970s, and the Javan tiger in the 1980s. Surviving are the Siberian or Amur tiger, the Bengal, the Indo-Chinese, the Malayan, and the Sumatran tigers. They are all endangered. And the last South China tigers can only be found in captivity. We know every tiger in the North American zoos, and we know its lineage. We know every parent, grandparent, great-grandparent, great-great-grandparent, all the way back to its wild-caught mother and father. So we know exactly where they came from in Russia for the Amur tigers, and we know who they mated with and who their offspring. So we have these, like, giant family trees. Unlike most zoos, most private owners don't know the lineage of their tigers because no one has kept track of their pedigrees. Yeah, there you go, Elvis. 
Tigers from different subspecies resemble each other, and most breeders aren't interested in keeping subspecies pure. As for subspecies, I, I don't believe in them. I don't care. And s some of them might have more Bengal blood in them because some of them don't actually grow the big, thick fur in winter. Some of them do, so I know they have a lot of Siberian blood with them. The white tiger is the best example of breeding for looks. Loved for its striking appearance, it's not a subspecies, but a color morph. The result of a recessive gene that causes one in every 10,000 tigers to be born white. White tigers are almost non-existent in the wild, but they are often bred in captivity. This has made them highly inbred and more susceptible to health problems. And that's not the only consequence of private ownership. People notice that many tigers in captivity might be bigger than in a wild, because in a wild you need to stay athletic to catch prey. In captivity, they get their food served basically on a silver platter. And one of the reasons many tigers in captivity are huge, they are simply fat, they are obese, not good for their liver. A lot of the stuff American tigers are fed, it's basically stuff we eat, it's from supermarket. Some of the meat might have some hormones in them. The other theory is some breeders might selectively breed for bigger size because it looks impressive on display. Huge tiger, it looks more impressive than small tiger. Might be simply because they just don't exercise as much as the ones in the wild, because any cat, even in the wild, if they don't have to move, they don't move, they sleep. The scientific community has labeled these tigers as generic. They look like tigers, but are they really? Tigers in the wild are generally solitary and secretive, coming together during the mating season and perhaps to share a kill. In captivity, they become very sociable with both humans and other tigers. They haven't been taught how to hunt and could starve if left on their own. Has the very essence of tigerness been bred out of them? What we do know about subspecies, legitimate subspecies, is that we know, we know what their genetic makeup is according to molecular biology. Okay, it can be defined. And that is why the, the, the private ownership tigers, they will never contribute to the conservation of wild tigers, simply because, not because they, they're not a tiger, because in a sense they are a panthera tigris, that's the Latin name for what a tiger is. But it's, they've lost their tigerness. They've lost their tigerness. And what we mean by that is they, they have been inbred and crossbred to the point where no one knows what their lineages are. And everyone knows the more inbreed you, you have, the greater risks or susceptibility to diseases. You become less fit. And when you become less fit, your ability to survive in the wild becomes negligible. The American tiger is really a junk tiger. It is nothing more than an illusion of a tiger. In 2005, Ron Tilson and Tammy Tees worked together to stop the breeding of tigers in Minnesota. They're concerned about the conditions in which private tigers are kept. So Sabrina is supposed to be a Sumatran Bengal mix, and she's our worst abuse case we've seen. She charged the fence nonstop. Mm hmm Yeah. But she does have, from this up around the face and that sort of this Sumatran look to her with this, the really black stripe. And she's got a lot longer. They'd welcome a federal ban on breeding and ownership if it were to pass tomorrow. I wouldn't want to see these animals abused. You can't do that. That I would lose sleep over. But I would certainly like to see them all neutered, and I would like to see them well taken care of until they die. Would that bother me? No, that would put me to sleep really well. We'll just simply lose a large number of uh, worthless tigers that consume resources that should be spent on wild tigers and that actually corrupt the, the message that we're, we're doing something wonderful for tigers when in fact we're not doing anything for tigers. Why are we spending all of this time and energy and money 
in trying to protect the right to own this or even allowing it to happen and putting people at risk and I keep coming back to these same issues. I don't get it. I don't get why it isn't stopped. Conservationists have been reluctant to study or give any attention to American tigers. However, with the crisis in the wild, some of the scientific community are taking a closer look at these generic tigers. Stephen O'Brien is former chief of the Laboratory of Genomic Diversity at the National Cancer Institute. He's an authority on big cat genetics and evolutionary biology. But his work has sparked controversy in the conservation world. Is there a value in the admixture in tigers? That is, tigers that have an ancestry that includes interbreeding between different subspecies. Of course there's a value in it. It's still a tiger. Most of the tigers in captivity are considered by, by friends and colleagues to be junk because they're hybrids between different subspecies. And many of them are. But I wasn't sure how many. Stephen O'Brien's team has recently designed a method to determine the genetic makeup of big cats. So we used this DNA fingerprint technology that was developed to identify the difference between subspecies of tigers. And I said, if you take one of these tigers that we don't know, is it really a hybrid? Well, what we found was that many of them are indeed pure subspecies. They were either Bengal, or they were Amur, or they were Sumatran, or one of the living subspecies. I think the captive population should not be discounted. The reassessment of these generic tigers has led to another exciting discovery. Not only are some of them purebred subspecies, they also have a rich genetic diversity, as rich as in the wild population. Since their ancestors were taken from the wild when tigers were thriving, some captive tigers have retained many characteristics, perhaps now lost in wild tigers. Tiger conservationists have been quick to point out that the sample studied by Stephen O'Brien did not include a significant number of backyard bred tigers. Still, he believes that each tiger counts. My personal feeling about it is we're backing up a tiger population in the wild that is not doing very well. And uh, to tell you the truth, I'd rather have the animal alive in a few hundred years than simply lose it by exterminating all the captive animals, which is, you know, one solution. Um, I, you know, maybe, uh, maybe that's uh, not a reasonable thing. You know, I, I, I realize not everybody, not everybody agrees with that. But I really think that, you know, when evolution creates a, a species as magnificent as the tiger, it only does it once. And if you lose it, it's not going to come back. It seems that some captive tigers could play a role in the survival of the species. But what about privately owned American tigers? Will they be around long enough to be part of the solution? The wild tiger population was almost 10,000 in 1990. 20 years later, there are only about 3,000 animals left, and they are vanishing faster than ever. When I first moved into this office 25 years ago, I had this big concrete wall, and I wondered what I wanted to put on it. And it came to me, why don't I have the covers of magazines that are focusing on tiger issues? It uh, starts back here, the new scientist. Um, does the tiger have a future? That's what we're talking about right now. Too late for tigers in Wildlife Conservation Magazine. Doomed, cover of Time Magazine. The Last Tigers. Initially, I thought they were very interesting because it gave me a focus. But what happened was is that this message just became such a common message. It's a little bit like, um, uh, the sky is falling down, the sky is falling down, and after a while, no one hears you calling. World leaders seem to be finally waking up to the dire future facing wild tigers. 
In November 2010, an international summit was held in St. Petersburg. The goal was to develop a strategy to save the wild tiger from extinction. Heads of state from the 13 Tiger Range countries set a target to double the population by 2022 and committed over 230 million euros. But is that enough? The threats facing the Asian big cat are many and serious. In August 2011, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service announced that it wanted to reinstate a permitting process to control the breeding of generic tigers. This would severely reduce the number of tigers bred in captivity. But for the proponents of a total ban on private ownership, things aren't moving fast enough on Capitol Hill. Along with private owners, the entertainment industry is lobbying to slow down the legislative process. I am, I am very annoyed that this bill is in the status that it is. It's, it's just up in the air right now because we can't... Um, I am not going to buckle and say it's okay to breed these animals. It's a huge problem. Come on, Asia. Yeah, she's a little fat. She's getting old. You gotta maybe try the... But tigers have created jobs and income. They appear in movies. They are still popular in circuses. And there's even an industry that's created a special diet for them. In these days of economic turmoil, a ban that would cost American jobs isn't easy for a politician to support. I, to be honest, I really don't know what the federal ban will do because like so many of the federal regulations and the state laws, there's gonna be exemptions carved out of a federal ban on breeding tigers and other big cats. So the circus industry could be exempt, entertainment could be exempt. It'll be a very long process because there's a lot of money involved. From the professional's standpoint, it's a sensitive issue because they're being regulated out of the business. And well, from the owner's standpoint, it's a sensitive issue because they're attached to the animal. And they're emotional about it. Only recently, American tigers have come under scientific and legal scrutiny and their fate raises many questions. But if the wild population is to double, animals bred in captivity will be required for the complex process of reintroduction. Even though conservationists have every reason to be pessimistic about the future of the tiger, there is still some hope. We're on the cusp of a new revolution in tiger conservation, and that is looking at reintroduction of captive individuals back into spaces where they once lived. The big issue <laughs> is, can captive tigers actually go out and live and survive on their own in the wilderness areas? The honest answer to that is, don't know. There's some who say no, they have to be taught how to do this and they learn from their mothers and the mother can't teach them if there aren't natural prey. But in fact, all of these uh, are little roadblocks. All of these can be taken care of and, and surmounted. Captive bred lions and cheetahs have been introduced into the wild in South Africa. This has encouraged Chinese officials. Today, South China tigers are being prepared in Africa for their reintroduction in China. Each generation will be released into a larger and wilder setting. They will learn how to hunt, teach their skills to their offspring, while having less and less contact with humans. But preparing tigers for their release is only half of the challenge. Experts know that wild tigers need space, and 250 kilo predators also need prey. Preserving the ecosystems of tiger range countries is as crucial as preserving the tigers themselves. That's why there are so few of these rewilding efforts. We need some new ideas if we're going to really realize the prediction of the St. Petersburg summit to double tigers in the wild. And one of the possibilities is to be exploring places where we can restore tigers. Central Asia, the former range of the extinct Caspian tiger, is a vast region with a sparse population. 
Countries like Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan did not participate in the St. Petersburg summit, but they are prime candidates for bold conservation initiatives. It's a habitat area which is very low in human density, which is important for reintroduction of tigers, which has the potential of being homes for tigers from different parts of the world. There are conservationists in these areas that I think, in fact, I know, would be very interested in hosting tiger reconstitution or reintroduction in those regions. For these programs to work, more tigers will be needed. The fate of thousands of privately owned tigers is being debated by scientists, lawyers, and politicians. So far, no one has asked for any of these tigers to be shipped overseas. Princess, look at mommy. Princess! Will the American tiger have the chance to play a role in the future of the species? That has yet to be determined. But perhaps one day, an American-born tiger will be set free to join its wild cousins.